fish fans. My name is Dr. Jesse Sanders and I am a fish veterinarian. You are currently in my mobile practice, Aquatic Veterinary Services. Our business is 10 years old and since a lot of you don't really know what I do as a fish veterinarian, I am going to be putting together a lot more videos so you can kind of see what I do on a daily basis taking care of people's pet fish in both indoor tanks and outdoor ponds. So for today, we have a pond that has two fish that look a little suspiciously bumpy or swollen in the back end. I've, I've seen two, two pictures that were emailed to me. Um, and we get this a lot, especially in koi. So the best way to take a look at these fish in the inside is using my new ultrasound machine. So this is not the first time I've used it. This is actually going to be the second, but I'm kind of glad because I brought my tripod, which is what's holding my camera up. Um, Cause that's the one thing I had kind of issue with. It's using your phone and your hand, and then you can't control the fish. So by using this tripod, I'll be able to hold my video screen where I need it to be, and we'll be able to get some cool pictures. So first I'm going to test some water chemistry, which although it doesn't sound very fun, it is very, very important and then we'll pull a couple fish out for exams. So thankfully, this is a pond I have a lot of experience with. This is one of our clients that has been with us, I think since year one. So I'm very familiar with these fish, very familiar with this pond, which is really good because if you're not as familiar with these ponds, it can be a little tricky sometimes to get the fish out, but I'm really good at it. So I'll show you my tips and tricks and some of our custom equipment that I just got that I can't wait to try out um, to take a look at these fish and see what's going on. All right, so here is our pond. And here are our fish. So again, I only saw two pictures, but we got this guy. Definitely got a little lumpy belly there. And then there's another one over there. That orange one with kind of the white head. Those are the two that we're going to be looking at today. And you see, this is a fairly large pond. I've got a lot of rocks at the bottom. They currently like me right now. Uh, we've had couple different health issues over the years with this pond, but for the most part, everybody's pretty happy. So again, we're going to start with the water quality testing, and then we'll pull a couple of these lovely fish out. So when I test water quality, I'm using the Hawk Fish Farmers FF1A test kit. Um, again, the model number is right there. I understand they've been out of stock for a while, but this is an old complete test kit, and then I've been restocking different pieces of it as I use them up. Uh, I have switched out the Nestler's test for the ammonia one that is the salicylic test um, just because there's a couple water conditioners that people frequently use that can confuse the Nestler's in this. So I switched this out and then we have our nitrate that is the one thing that is not included in this test kit. So we usually do ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH, cage, and temperature. Um, I also have a little salinity probe in here Ooh, my trash bag so again here's my little salinity probe in here um but yeah this is everything we're going to use to test water quality Everything on water chemistry is looking good and within range, so now it's time to get to some fish. Uh, we got our exam tub all ready here to go. It's got about 10 gallons or 40 liters, and I went ahead and added our MS222 at about 80 milligrams per liter, and our sodium carbonate at about 50 milligrams per liter. So let's go catch some fish. All right, so when it comes to catching fish at a large pond, I usually just need my sock net here and my herding net. But since this pond is kind of an awkward shape and really long, I need a seine net. So this is basically a large rectangular net that has weights on one side and floats on the bottom. And I'm gonna try to put it right along the midline there. We'll see how good I throw it. Like I said, I have plenty of practice at this pond. Um, and then our custom nets here. Um, my mom actually made these for me. 
So this is our sock nut. Um, koi goes in one way, comes out the back. But if you see here, these got zippers on them. So I can actually change these out between clients. And again, with my herding net, again with zippers. And this is a brand new design my mom just made me that's a little bit deeper. So hopefully it'll hold the fish and they won't kind of bounce around in this. So use this to kind of herd them into a spot. Use this to pull them to the side and use this to get them up and into the exam tub. So we'll see how I do today. too easy but I've had over 10 years of practice and in this case I know this pond really well so I know where the fish like to hang out. Uh, biggest issue with this pond is all the plants in here sometimes the seine net can get hooked over those so when I threw it over I was trying to go for the spot where there was the least amount of plants but you see I hooked these big reeds so I just kind of had to scoop underneath so now a little fish I don't know if I'm even directing this right direction is in our tub and we'll let her get sleepy and then we'll do our exam. All right, so here we have our nice sedated fish. As you can see, she's still breathing just fine on her own. Um, just maybe a little bit slower. Um, but yeah, definitely distended. Slow the cavity there. Putting the ultrasound there. You can see some of these veins are pretty stretched out, um, which usually means this has been progressing for a while. Um, there is a history in this pond of uh, at least one other fish. Uh, if, uh, no, that's two at least that have had salomic tumors, um, so there is a chance. Gills are looking pretty good, um, but I'm going to go ahead with the skin and gill biopsies. Um, I saw one of the other fish flashing, so we just want to make sure that there's nothing else going on that's stressing these girls out. So I take my skin slash mucus biopsy. Sorry, get away from the camera. I take my skin slash mucus biopsies from underneath the fins because if there is something and they have been scratching, that's the spot where they're least likely to knock something off. And then for our gill biopsies, I really like these scissors that have these little hooks in them. These are just common suture scissors. Um, so we're just going to go take a little tiny piece of the gill filaments and look at those under the microscope. Um, we can look for parasites. But it also just gives us a little bit more history on anything that's happened in the past um, as far as that piece of cartilage that runs down the middle of the gills and how's that look. All right, so this is her slide here. We have two skin biopsies, one for under the pectoral fin, one under the pelvic fin, and a little bit of gills. So we'll look at that under the microscope and I do have a camera mount for that as well. All right, now for our ultrasound, again, she's nice and passed out. We have our lovely little butterfly here all ready to go go ahead and turn that on and um, what i didn't have last time was this nice little tripod mount which i'm gonna now put my camera in um, or my phone should i say and that will allow me to see um, what's going on without having to hold that and the probe and the fish so just have to hold the fish and the <laughs> fish and the probe because that will be holding still thumbs up in the back of my fish car we got our extra tubs right here and here is my lovely microscope we got a camera mount and then power that's running to a little power converter out there so this is how we take a look at fish skin gills anything that's too tiny for me to really see um, head clearance is 
a little questionable. I might have hit my head several times on this, but we only have a tour of our car if you want to see all this other crazy stuff that I have in here. But for now, I'm going to hook up the camera mount and we'll take a look at some skin and gills. Again, I only saw one fish flashing, but given that these two are compromised and all their skin is stretched out, um, they might have some bigger issues. Uh, this is the time of year when if there's anything lingering in the pond, it starts kind of taking off because it's just warm enough where the parasites can replicate very quickly and the fish's immune system kind of lags behind a little bit. So let's see what these girls have on them. All right. Since the zoom on the eyepiece, or excuse me, the focus on the eyepiece and the focus on my camera here are a little bit off, um, I went ahead and took a quick tour already. So these are the gills. This is only at 40x, so the eyepieces, uh, the eyepiece that's attached to here is at 10, and then the one on the scope is at 4. So just looking around, again, we're mostly looking at the edge, and then there's this piece of cartilage that runs right down the middle, kind of that bluish stick, um, and this is what gives our gills some rigidity. But it can also kind of give us a back history of what's been going on in this pond, if there's any breaks, any odd shapes to it. Um, this junk in the end here is normal for this pond that has lots of algae and debris. Overall, these are fairly unremarkable, which is fine. So if I your gaze, I'm going to slide real quick over to the skin. So again, we're all on the same slide. So with this, I usually walk up and down, starting on the far edge, kind of winding my way over. I don't really find anything on this guy, which is good. I mean, we, we, we don't really want to find things, but again, I did see one fish flashing, which again, I'm scraping a very, very small percentage of the body. Cause obviously if I scrape the whole fish silly, he wouldn't have any mucus to protect himself. So I'm taking very small samples, hoping that I'm going to catch something that's in a denser cluster. And again, I'll stop every once in a while. Thankfully with most parasites, they're usually going to be moving around or wiggling. So I'm just going to focus in and out on that little piece that's a little lighter. And then sometimes it will be swimming versus swirling. So swirling is a particulate that is caught in water. Because again, this, this sample is pretty much suspended in water. So sometimes things can look like they're moving when they're really not. So essentially you just have to essentially stare at a lot of samples. and watch what the water flow is doing. So thankfully we're in a fairly calm area. There's not a lot of wind. My car is not on and vibrating, which can certainly impede that. But for the most part, this fish is looking rather unremarkable, which, which is good giving its current disease status. All right, for the second fish, um, you can see here the ends of the gill filaments are highly irregular and this is not um artifact from me doing that samples this is indications that this fish is having health issues building those end tips there and they're just highly irregular so this fish again this is the one i saw grossly had some kind of odd features of their gills those ends are just super pale so this kind of explains the reasoning why and i'm gonna go find them again there's one little parasite He's hiding pretty good. Gotta remember where he was hiding. So let's see if I can zoom in on this. So I pick the right setting. So this, I'm trying to get him in focus, is known as a fluke or a monogenean trematode. So there's two main genuses of these, um, dactylogyrus, which are typically in the gills, but not always, and gyrodactylus, which is usually on the skin, but not always. Uh, really the biggest thing you can kind of use to differentiate the two is by if there is a new little baby inside. Um, gyrodactylus are live bearers, where dactylogyrus are egg bearers egg layers, excuse me. And the dactylogyrus also has little spots on his face, kind of like a smiley face, which um, again, depends on how familiar you are with these, but this guy definitely has a smiley face. So this is a dactylogyrus parasite, but it's the only one. And given the state of this fish's gills, I'm not that concerned. Um, this fish has certainly some health issues that are making things worse that again, would 
kind of predispose them to having some secondary health issues like parasites. All right, now we're back at 4X, taking a look at the skin. I didn't find anything earlier. Um, I do get some questions about my microscope sometimes. Um, it is not fancy. I believe it was about $300 off Amazon. The only reason I went a little bit more expensive is because it had a nice little camera mount. So this, I looked around for having an incorporated video camera specific to a microscope and they were obscenely expensive. They were like twice, if not three times the cost of the microscope. So instead I found a lovely little $8 adapter for my cell phone, which is fan. Fantastic. Um, and again, this is not anything expensive. I think this is my third microscope that I've gone through. So they have a yeah, fairly good lifespan, about three, three, four years. Um, obviously technology has gotten better over time, but this is also on the lowest contrast setting. If I were to turn the light all the way up, yeah, you can't see anything there. So again, we have this on the lowest contrast setting. Thankfully I have some shade so I can actually see what's going on. Um, but yeah, fairly unremarkable. Again, I stop every once in a while, see what's going on. Lots of algae and schmutz. So. so since these are the fish that are the sickest in the pond and they're not really showing that many health issues other than what's secondary to their internal tumors, I'm not going to pull anyone else out of the pond. However, given their ultrasound findings, which I believe their entire salomic cavity has basically turned to tumor, um, they are going to be humanely euthanized per the owner's requests. So since I've been looking at their samples here, um, they've been sitting in about 200 milligrams per liter of MS-222. And then we have a captive bolt, which obviously I'm not going to be putting on camera because that can scare a lot of people. But just for those of you who do euthanize fish, um, don't freeze them. Don't flush them out of the toilet. I mean, with these you really couldn't. Don't just dig a hole and throw them in. Um, if you are doing an overdose of either clove oil or MS-222, it's really a good idea to have a secondary method of euthanasia. In this case, we have a captive bolt. Some small fishes, we're going to exsanguinate them by usually cutting a gill arch, but very important that this is done correctly and by somebody who actually knows what they're doing, or else your fish could needlessly suffer more. So, fortunately, kind of a sad end to our appointment today, uh, but that's just what my job is. Again, I'm glad that I can give this owner some peace of mind that we know what's going on. We know that other, the other fish, this isn't anything contagious or one little gill fluke. I don't suspect to be a big issue, but if we do see more fish affected, we know what's going on and we can prescribe medication for them just based on that one little finding. So we're going to go ahead and get those fish packed up and then we'll be headed back to, or headed out to the next pond almost said back to the base, but we got another one today. So I hope you've enjoyed kind of seeing a little bit more of what I do. Um, we are going to be putting together more of these videos fairly soon. I have conned someone into riding along with me, paying them in lunch, so we can get a little bit more of what I'm doing rather than me having to hold the camera and try to do all my things, which you know, I can kind of do at this point, but if you have any questions for me, um, we'll be putting together a question list for while we're driving around to all these different ponds, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about me or what I do. So thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon.